I've enjoyed this conference tremendously, and not just listening to uh, the presentations, but uh, also engaging in the, uh, uh, listening to the conversations and being able to participate in conversations. Uh, you know, really, you guys are the reformers. You, you go back to your churches, take all this, uh, this back, and uh, hopefully it will be grist, not uh, just for critique, and uh, much less for despair, uh, but to, to take back and really think through the issues with your elders and pastors and friends, and uh, hopefully we can, we can see a tremendous recovery, as indeed is taking place all around the country and around the world as people focus again on the richness uh, of the gospel. One example uh, I promised uh, my uh, friend Rico Tice I would mention their excellent uh, program, Christianity Explored. It, I don't know if you've uh, heard of it. If you haven't, check it out online. That's, that's one great point of light out there as far as introducing non-Christians to the faith for the first time, uh, especially if you've, you, you, you don't want to do the Alpha course. Uh, this is uh, put together by Rico Tice at All Souls, uh, uh, formerly pastored by John Stott in London. And uh, it's, uh, it's a fantastic outreach program through the Gospel of Mark. Uh, and uh, 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 there, are, there are all sorts of really great uh, resources out there for introducing people to the true Gospel. While I was doing a postdoctoral research fellowship uh, on the East Coast, a mainline theologian said that uh, he decided to go to his daughter's and son-in-law's house for Easter one year. And uh, he said they go to a, one of these sprawling uh, evangelical uh, church growth churches based on church growth models and techniques, and he says, uh, I thought it would be interesting to go with them on, on Easter Sunday. He said, I thought, this would, I'll get them at their best. Everybody's at their best on Easter Sunday, talking about Jesus and the resurrection, and he's telling me the story. He said he, he went there, and he knew that his children were going to try to evangelize him because he's a mainline uh, theologian, and uh, he said, I walked in and there, there was nothing visibly that would suggest that I was in anything other than a mall. But I said, okay, I'm just going to sit down and, and, and it's, not all, it's not about that. I'm going to sit down and wait for God to open his mouth and start talking to us with God's greeting at the beginning. Well, there was no greeting from God at all. There was a greeting from the minister as if it were his living room welcoming people into his presence, but not God addressing his people. He says, I went through the whole service. I kept waiting. I said, well, they're evangelicals. They put everything into the sermon. There's no liturgy, but they'll put everything into the sermon. The Word of God all gets poured into this one half-hour presentation. I'll wait for that. And he said, this was Easter. We had not yet sung anything about the cross and the resurrection. We had, never, we had not heard any Scripture read. And we had not prayed. There had been a, a couple of, of uh, quick hey there's, but not real prayer, co uh, corporate congregational prayer. He says, so we got to the sermon, and uh, it was about how you can turn your scars into stars and your crosses into stepping stones. Jesus conquered his opposition, and so can you. There was no gospel in it. It wasn't about what he had done for us. It was about how what he did can be done by us too. They got in the car and drove home, and it was pretty quiet. And the son said, well, Pop, did you, uh, did you hear the gospel today? And he uh, said, no. <laughs> he said, uh, well, did it touch your heart? Did what touch my heart? <laughs> well, did, did the Spirit touch your heart? He said, 
How could the Spirit possibly have touched my heart? His word wasn't present. He says, I have been in liberal churches where there was more of the Word of God, at least in the liturgy, than was in the whole service in what I thought was an evangelical church on Easter. For anyone coming in wanting hope for the resurrection of the body on the last day, I was not a recipient of that myself. I don't know how you could imagine that I could have been evangelized today when God didn't even show up. This situation can be found across the board. I'm hearing it more and more. It's not, you know, when I was growing up, we used to be kind of, uh, kind of arrogant about it. We, we knew the churches in town, they had the bells the tall steeples, you know, that's, that's, where, that's where it was Christless Christianity. But today you can't, you can't point to anything. It's across the board today. It's across the spectrum from fundamentalist to liberal, from Arminian to professing reformed. It, you can't tell from the marquee what is going to characterize the service on any given Sunday in a lot of churches across America and around the world. Yesterday I mentioned Romans 10 as a way of framing this, that we have this perennial tendency to try to climb the ladder, ascend the ladder to either bring God down to us or descend into the depths to try to bring Christ back up from the dead as if, as if He isn't raised and at the right hand of the Father whereas the righteousness which is through faith receives the gift of God in Jesus Christ as He descends to us. We've heard about the second century heresy of Gnosticism and how it is so often revived. It's stated in bald terms today by Matthew Fox when he says the way to kill the soul is to worship a God outside of you. And when you put together those elements that Peter Jones was describing earlier today with the heresy of Pelagianism, that is the heresy of self-salvation, you have the perfect storm. And that perfect storm creates the phenomenon of what we're going to talk about uh, in the next 20 minutes or half an hour here of uh, moralistic therapeutic deism. Pelagianism is named after a fifth century British monk who challenged the church's teaching of salvation by grace. His main uh, uh, focus of opposition was the great church father Augustine. And Pelagius taught that we are not born in sin at all. Adam serves as a bad example. That is the impact and influence that Adam has on us. And of course, if that's all the problem we have, the only kind of savior you need is a good example. And that's exactly what Jesus is. He's the first, Finney was, or Finney, whoops. I get them confused so often. Pelagius, Pelagius was the first author of the what would Jesus do philosophy of religion, where everything, the focus of everything was on what would Jesus do without having a clue about what Jesus has done. If you have a little problem, you need a little solution, and that's exactly what Pelagius had. He had a little problem. You, you're good, but you could be better. What, what will make you better? Good instructions. A more moderate version soon arose known as semi-Pelagianism, not quite as bald in its denial of original sin and Christ's substitutionary atonement and salvation by grace. Pelagius didn't even think you needed grace at all. The semi-Pelagian said, no, you need grace, but free will gets it started. And, and then to keep it going, you need grace. Both Pelagianism and semi-Pelagianism were condemned by more church councils than any heresy in history. 
Did you know that? The, in, in the sixth century at the Council of Orange, even semi-Pelagianism was condemned. You even have the words, whosoever believes that we are saved by the saying of a prayer when it is the grace of God that leads us to pray for salvation, let him be anathema. I mean, these were, these, these were days when there was a little bit more clarity <laughs> uh, about grace. But in the late Middle Ages, this semi-Pelagianism came back with a vengeance. The bumper sticker in the Middle Ages was, facientibus inseas deus non denegat gradium. To those who do what lies within them, God will give his grace. You, you do your part, and God will do his part. And that's why the Reformation was necessary, because of this renewal, this revival of semi-Pelagianism. Charles Spurgeon rightly said that Pelagianism is our natural heresy. We don't have to be taught it. This is, this is a doctrine we don't have to be taught. This is what we naturally believe. Ask the average American what he or she believes, and what you'll get is Pelagianism, or at, at, or at best, semi-Pelagianism. And so we've got to be taught out of it, and not at the beginning of the Christian life, but every single week. We have to be taught out of this native, natural religion of our fallen heart. So the Gnostic component of this moralistic, therapeutic deism is evident in the fact that our culture turns inward for its authority, turns inward for its salvation. We're not sinners who need to be rescued by a God who is outside of us, but divine souls that need to be enlightened so that they can have peace of mind and serenity and peace. So how do we substantiate this? What is moralistic therapeutic deism? Let me first of all introduce it uh, with a couple of statistics and then talk uh, briefly here about Christian Smith and his coining this term. First of all, George Barna writes, the mar marketing and uh, po uh, uh, polling consultant, writes, to increasing millions of Americans, God, if we even believe in a supernatural deity, exists for the pleasure of humankind. He resides in the heavenly realm solely for our utility and benefit. Although we are too clever to voice it, we live by the notion that true power is accessed not by looking upward, but by turning inward. So even though I would argue his cure is part of the disease that he's documenting here, uh, I'm pointing to his statistics to document the problem. He says, unless something changes, it will be every man for himself with no second thoughts or regrets about the personal or societal implications of this incredibly selfish, nihilistic, narcissistic way of life. He says, most Americans have at least an intellectual assent when it comes to God, Jesus Christ, and angels. They believe that the Bible is a good book filled with important stories and moral lessons, and they believe that religion is very important in their lives. But this same group of people, including many professing Christians, also believe that people are inherently good, that our primary purpose is to enjoy life as much as possible. The chief end of man is to glorify ourselves and enjoy ourselves forever. Now, I mentioned that medieval bumper sticker, God will not deny his grace to those who do what lies within them. What is, what's a typical American version of that? God helps those who help themselves. And Barna in his survey shows that 82% of Americans and a majority of evangelicals thought that was a quotation from the Bible. He says a majority believe that, quote, all people pray to the same God or spirit no matter what name they use for that spiritual being, 
and that if a person is generally good or does good enough things for others during their life, they will earn a place in heaven. Then after citing a series of reports, Barna concludes, in short, the spirituality of America is Christian in name only. We desire experience more than knowledge. We prefer choices to absolutes. We embrace preferences rather than truths. We seek comfort rather than growth. Faith must come on our terms or we reject it. We have enthroned ourselves as the final arbiters of righteousness the ultimate rulers of our own experience and destiny, we are the Pharisees of the new millennium. And the fact that George Barna seems to advocate a view of the Christian life that's very similar to this, it seems to feed this, shows that as evangelicals we can nod at the problems. When we hear criticisms, we can nod. And then what we do in practice is actually going on as if that weren't true, as if we were still feeding it. And that's, I think, the challenge here. It's one of the reasons I'm quoting his, stir his uh, surveys. So we, we can't just tinker around the edges. We need a new paradigm. We need a God-centered rather than human-centered paradigm. God defines the real world. See, we don't have a real world and then say, how does God fit into, my, fit into the real world? Do you hear people say that? Yeah, but how does God fit in to the real world? What's the assumption there? What, is, what are they calling the real world? They're calling the real world that which the Apostle Paul calls the age that is fading away. The real world is the kingdom that cannot be shaken, coming down out of heaven. So first of all, we have to ask ourselves, what is the real world? It's not our lives that define the relevance of God. It's God who defines His own relevance. He's our Creator, and therefore He tells us how relevant He is. In this context, as Newsweek magazine reports, churches have developed a, I'm quoting here, have developed a pick-and-choose Christianity in which individuals take what they want and pass over what doesn't fit their spiritual goals. What many have left behind is a pervasive sense of sin. It's great when you have Newsweek to, to tell you what the problem is in the churches in America. A decade later, Newsweek added in yet another cover story on the search for the sacred these words. Disguised in the secular language of psychotherapy, the search for the sacred has turned sharply inward, a private quest. The goal over the last 40 years has been variously described as peace of mind, higher consciousness, personal transformation. Sounds like a lot of the titles in Christian bookstores today and sermons. Or in its silliest incarnation, self-esteem. In this environment, many searching Americans flit from one tradition to the next, tasting now the nectar of this traditional wisdom, now of that, but like butterflies, they remain mostly up in the air. Years ago, the well-known secular psychologist Carl Menninger wrote that book, Whatever Became of Sin. So, you know, you, there's a certain diagnosis that we don't have as psychologists and your churches are putting a lot of people on our couches because we can't explain that phenomenon and you're not putting your finger on it. You're not identifying a phenomenon. You don't have confession and absolution. You don't have any forgiveness because you don't talk about sin. We keep having to hear these things from secular psychologists and periodicals because it's just not happening in a lot of churches. Episcopal Bishop C. Fitzsimmons Allison calls it pastoral cruelty not to tell the truth about sin. It's pastoral, pastorally cruel when people have this aching sense of anxiety, depression, and guilt not to tell them what the objective source of that is so that they can be forgiven. But we trivialize sin. Fundamentalism reduces sin to certain behaviors. So if you can stop doing those things, you're okay. Sin, then, is what those other people do out there. 
Liberalism, exactly the same thing. Sin is reduced to social structures. In either case, sin is deflected from me to outsiders. It's not a condition that we all share together, a mess that we're all in, a common judgment and condemnation in which we all participate. It's rather something that defines those people out there who, of course, are not like me. In his bestseller, The Triumph of the Therapeutic, Philip Reef describes how pop psychology has transformed our entire worldview. It's not just that... Ther- you know, this is not a tirade on, on uh, therapy, anyone who's had uh, counseling. This is, this is uh, the, the critique here and that Philip Reif makes is that therapy has become our worldview. Now it's our worldview. We think in therapeutic terms. And he says, and he's not a believer that I know of, but he said, Christian man was born to be saved. Psychological man is born to be pleased. So how can I, a sinner, be justified before a holy God isn't even on the radar in a therapeutic mindset? It's an answer to a question people aren't even asking. In a therapeutic worldview, it doesn't even come to consciousness that that would be a reasonable question. So Christian Smith has called this moralistic, therapeutic deism. Christian Smith was at the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill when he and a a group of colleagues put together a study from 2001 to 2005 of America's teens and published it with Oxford University Press. He is now at the University of Notre Dame and has just written another book. In fact, we just last week interviewed him on this one too, uh, this latest one uh, for the White Horse Inn. Fascinating uh, data on what happened to these young people five years later. Uh, That book has just been published. It's hot off the press. This one is Souls in Transition, The Religious and Spiritual Lives of America's Emerging Adults. Uh, in 2009, and the one before it that coined the term moralistic therapeutic deism was published in 2007. From his extensive interviews, Smith concluded that the dominant form of religion or spirituality among America's teens right now is moralistic, therapeutic, and deistic. First of all, he says, it's difficult to define this somewhat amorphous spirituality, especially since, ironically, 22% of teen deists in our survey reported feeling very or extremely close to God, the God they believe isn't involved in the world today. See, this is part of the contradiction. You have to ask all the questions in order to get a full a full answer because it's, it's we, not, you know, we, we believe all sorts of things in contradiction. Apparently, God's involvement is restricted to the inner sphere of one's private world. God is very involved in my heart, but God doesn't seem to be very involved in the world. Smith observed that most teens, including those reared in evangelical churches who said that their faith is, quote, very important in their lives and makes a big difference in their lives, are, in his words, stunningly inarticulate concerning the actual content of that faith. He said, interviewing teens, one finds little evidence that the agents of religious socialization in this country, parents, pastors, teachers, are being effective and successful with the majority of their young people. In contrast to previous generations that at least had some residual knowledge of the Bible and basic Christian teachings, he says, it seems that there is very little serious ability to state, much less to reflect upon and examine their beliefs, much less to relate them to daily life. What is moralistic therapeutic deism? There's a creed. Uh, The first article in this creed, according to Christian Smith, is that God created the world. 
Everybody in America nearly believes that God created the world. They say they do anyway. What that means is uh, up for grabs, but most Americans say that God created the world. Two, God wants people to be good, nice, and fair to each other. God is the everlasting Mr. Rogers. And this doctrine is taught in the Bible, but also in most world religions. Three, the central goal of life is to be happy and to feel good about yourself. Four, God does not need to be particularly involved in your life except when he's needed to resolve a problem. You know, like uh, a butler. You whistle, and here he comes, and otherwise he's out of the way. And then five, good people go to heaven when they die. So it's moralistic, it's therapeutic, and it's theistic. It's moralistic because it, all good people, we're all good people, could just be a little bit better. All good people go to heaven when they die because they're good people. It's therapeutic because it's all about what God can do for me, otherwise he's out of the picture, but can, how can he contribute along with all of these other things and people in my life? How can he contribute to making me happy? How can he contribute to this movie that is my life? Great title of a book uh, published a few years ago, uh, Life the Movie Starring Everyone. That's, that's how we live, as if we're in our own movie. We're, here, can I grab you as a character? A walk, you'll be a walk-on. I don't think you're going to be a close friend. But in, it, you'll be a walk-on, and I'll give you a few things, a couple dinners or something out of it. Basically, the message is God's nice, we're nice, so let's all be nice. Do young people raised in evangelical homes actually believe this? According to all of the studies that I've seen, yes, absolutely. In fact, we interviewed Christian Smith uh, on the first book a while back, and uh, I said, you know, you've got to be talking about a difference between Unitarians and Southern Baptists. He says, no, it's across the board. There is no difference between denominations. Conservative or liberal, Roman Catholic or Protestant, there is no difference. And on some of these points, the more a young person attended an evangelical church or youth group, the more likely he or she was to embrace moralistic therapeutic deism. This is not something the culture is doing to us. It's something the church is doing to itself, and it's affecting the culture. A lot of this that's going on in the culture is, the re is really the result of religion, which has always been very powerful in this country. It has been a, a very powerful force. Smith points out in, in his book that in the working theology of those I studied, being religious is about being good, and it's not about forgiveness. It is unbelievable the proportion of conservative Protestant teens who do not seem to grasp elementary concepts of the gospel concerning grace and justification. It's across all traditions." End quote. Recently, I came across a story in the newspaper on the remarkable success of a website called dailyconfession.com. Receives as many as 1.3 million hits a day as young people log on in order to share their intimate secrets and look for advice. One 19-year-old user of the site related, the idea of confessing isn't necessarily about right and wrong. It's about unloading a burden. It's almost cathartic. There's the therapeutic narcissism. It's not about right and wrong. It's not about objective guilt. It, it's, it's about a technique that I need to use a therapy I need to invoke so that I don't feel this way anymore. I can unload my burden. Far different is David's confession in Psalm 95 even after he had committed such atrocious sins against Bathsheba and her husband, and yet he can only say against you, O God, and you alone have I sinned 
and done what is evil in your sight. Do not throw me away. That vertical dimension is what's being lost. Either we're turning inward or we're turning outward on a horizontal plane, but looking upward in faith to the triune God who has revealed Himself in Jesus Christ seems to be increasingly replaced by a human-centered approach. And so the right rules and methods produce the right results. We've seen that with Charles Finney. That's why the pragmatism is already there. Joel Osteen says very clearly, if you just follow these steps, you get these results. This pervasive tendency toward Pelagianism in American Christianity is evident, as I say, across the spectrum. It, uh, it's worth observing that Norman Vincent Peale and Robert Schuller were ordained in the Reformed Church in America. Robert Schuller wrote years ago in his book, Self-Esteem, the New Reformation, it was appropriate for Calvin and Luther to think in a God-centered way, but the scales must tip the other way toward a human needs approach. In fact, classical Christian theology has erred in its insistence that theology be God-centered, not man-centered. Sin is any act or thought that robs myself or another human being of his or her self-esteem. And so what is hell? He says, it is the loss of pride that naturally follows separation from God, the ultimate and unfailing source of our soul's sense of self-respect. A person is in hell when he has lost his self-esteem, but the cross sanctifies the ego trip. I quoted that when we had him on the White Horse Inn and asked him in the light of that if he would be kind enough to respond to these words from Paul in 2 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 5. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, un unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving the good, treacherous, reckless, swollen, with pride, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. And before I was able to finish that, he interrupted and said, young man, I hope you don't preach that stuff. If you do, you'll hurt a lot of beautiful people. And when I pointed out to him, I was quoting a passage from the inspired apostle. He said, uh, just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean you need to preach it. Marsha Witten wrote a book, All is Forgiven, The Secular Message in American Protestantism, published by Princeton University Press in 1993. Marsha Witten, All is Forgiven, The Secular Message in American Protestantism. Isn't that a horrible title? to have to hear, all is forgiven, the secular message in American Protestantism. She's not a Christian. She says right from the outset, I, I am not a, a professing Christian, but she said, I wanted to study the texts of 47 sermons on the parable of the prodigal son delivered from 1986 to 1988 by various pastors of two denominations, the Presbyterian Church USA, mainline Presbyterian, and the Southern Baptist Convention. So I wanted to get sort of the, the, the left, samples from the left and the right, and what did I find? She found essentially what we're talking about here, moralistic, therapeutic deism. Her sermons reveal that there was little difference between the mainline Presbyterian and conservative Southern Baptist sermons. She says, the Calvinist roots of religious practice in colonial America were long ago eaten away by popular ideologies of voluntarism, democracy, and pragmatism, making the view that human beings cannot contribute to their own salvation seem less plausible. She adds, when God is seen in transcendent terms at all, 
in these sermons, his fearsome qualities are either de-emphasized or banished from the discourse and replaced by portraits of a clear-thinking, well-organized super-administrator in the sky. There's, there's, the de- there's the deism part. God as the ideal director of homeland security. Homeland defined as my personal peace and affluence and happiness. She says, we might even be inclined to feel sorry for this deity who's just waiting for the prodigal to return, to come to his senses. In fact, love overwhelms law. God sets aside any question of merit or duty and simply embraces the prodigal. This is that unconditional love thing that Dr. Sproul has been talking about. God never really surprises us. Grace is never a surprise. It's an of course. She says, this relatively weak notion of God is underscored by an almost complete lack of any construction of anxiety around one's future state. It's negative feelings, not an objectively negative danger that these sermons stressed as solved by the gospel. The transcendent, majestic, awesome God proclaimed by Luther and Calvin, whose image informed early Protestant visions, has undergone a softening of demeanor through the whole American experience of Protestantism with only minor interruptions. So, for example, she says, drugs and promiscuity aren't wrong because they offend God, according to most of these sermons, but because they can't compare with the joy and happiness and fulfillment and meaning that you have in becoming a Christian. They're not wrong, they're unfulfilling. They don't last. One of the sermons, she says, said, it feels good to be a Christian. When you're trying to sell a product like therapeutic transformation, there can be no ambiguity, no anxiety, no no complexity to life. It's got to be upbeat, happy, 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 happy all the time until you go home and collapse when no one's around. She says, in the Southern Baptist sermons, the world is the pig pen in which the prodigal wasted his inheritance with many sermons going into greater detail than Jesus ever did on cocktail parties, watching the vileness of Sodom in their living rooms, trying to escape reality with cocaine, end quote. Like, where's that in the text? But she says, that was what a lot of the Southern Baptist sermons did. The pig pen is the world, and the, the, the church is the, is the home they need to come back to, the good place. She said, the most common summary of the prodigal's fault in these sermons was that he rejected his own dignity and self-respect. But she says, for Presbyterian speakers, on the other hand, it's the dutiful, religiously obedient, yet joyless and judgmental older brother who is more likely to serve as the emblem of sin. So in the Southern Baptist sermons, the bad guy was the prodigal who needs to come home. And for the mainline Presbyterians, it was the judgmental older brother who was the the villain in the story. But in either case, it's those people out there who are like them. She says, all of the sermons depersonalize sin. It's not something done against a person. It's something that will hurt you or harm you. It's depersonalized, then it's generalized. No sin in particular, just living a way you shouldn't live and then it's deflected to outsiders. Here's one example. I've got to hurry up here. Without condoning their sin, said one Southern Baptist pastor, we should go out to the poor, the blacks, the Hispanics, the beer drinkers, and the divorced. What an interesting list. (laughs) Without condoning their sin, what? Uh, Hispanics, blacks, and the poor, uh, evidently, are uh, just inherently sinful because of their, their demographic. Talk about the outsider. This deflection of sin to outsiders 
is part and parcel of both sides. She says the pres mainline Presbyterians did the same thing. Now the outsiders are the conservative culture warriors. But she said they did exactly the same thing. And she points to Finney and draws the line from Finney to George Barna and others today who are making some of these same arguments. The bottom line is that we're in a situation that is very similar to the time where Jesus uh, told his contemporaries, to what com can I compare this generation? You're like children playing the funeral game and nobody cries. And then they turn and do the wedding game and nobody dances. John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking and you said, he has a demon. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and you said, Behold, a glutton and a drunkard, friend of tax gatherers and sinners. Jesus' point was, you don't know how to have a good funeral or a good party. You guys don't know how to laugh or cry. You don't know how to really mourn over your state and flee to me as your only salvation. I am the bridegroom. John came in sackcloth and ashes, mourning, but I'm the bridegroom coming for the bride. Come unto me, all you who are weary and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But you will not come to me. The bad news is too bad. And the good news is too good, so you settle for so-so news. Improving your lives. Following these steps and these rules and these principles to try to get back on track. The funeral game is just the warm-up for the wedding game. John the Baptist has to come, but he, he's not the main attraction. <laughs> Jesus is. In the 1950s, Yale theologian H. Richard Niebuhr gave this pithy and tragically accurate summary of liberalism. A God without wrath brought men without sin into a kingdom without judgment through a Christ without a cross. And that could describe our situation today. That is moralistic, therapeutic deism. But when people like Niebuhr and J. Gresham Machen in his book, Christianity and Liberalism, were describing Protestant liberalism, now it describes evangelicalism. That's the difference. That's the difference. Machen, in that great classic in the 1920s, asks the liberals, I have heard your exhortations and they will not help me but has anything been done to save me? That's all I ask. Just tell me the facts. That's what people need today. They need to hear the facts. They need to find themselves like that publican in our Lord's parable who couldn't lift up his eyes. He was so ashamed, so full of guilt. Find themselves addressed after they cry out, Lord, be merciful to me, a sinner. You go home justified today. Remember, it was the Pharisee who thanked God that he wasn't like those other people, deflecting sin to outsiders, but thanking God that he wasn't. He wasn't a Pelagian. He was a semi-Pelagian. He believed he needed grace to be better than other people. But the good news is not Good people can be better. You can have your best life now. The good news is that God has been merciful to sinners in His Son. And that's good news not only for us, but for the whole world, even for Christians. And may it become, once again, the focus of all of our preaching, our music, our teaching, our sacraments, our prayers, our witness, and our very lives. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you for sending your Son out of your love for us and proving that story from Genesis to Revelation as the trail of sacrificial blood leads from types and shadows to fulfillment. Help us, Father, to search out that scarlet thread of redemption throughout all of the Scriptures, and to find Christ there as the bread of life and the Savior of the world, for we pray in Jesus' name.
Amen.